Proteomics stocks is the topic of today's presentation, and we're going to do an update on seven proteomics stocks, Quanterix, Seer, Somalogic, Olink, Codexis, Nautilus Biotechnology, and QuantumSci. Now, Harvard has a nice page on proteins, and at least 10,000 different proteins make you what you are and keep you that way. So a protein's made up of 20 plus basic building blocks called amino acids. And because we don't store amino acids, our bodies make them in two different ways, either from scratch or by modifying others. Now, proteins make up the enzymes that power many chemical reactions in the hemoglobin that carries oxygen in your blood. So uh, as you would expect, the study of proteins can lead to better therapeutics. And there were a big accomplishment in that area was AlphaFold, and it's interesting how um, AI gets all the attention today because of a mediocre, politically biased chatbot. But back in the day when it beat the world's top Go player, uh, that didn't seem to make news, at least here in the Western world. And then that those same algorithms from Google's DeepMind then went and predicted the folding structure of proteins, over 200 million known proteins, and you can access them in this database. And that was said to be the golden age of proteomics, where the study of proteins would then advance like never before. Now, what I get excited about, and this is my favorite diagram, which shows the undiscovered potential of nature's amazing molecular machines. This diagram here I pulled from a TED Talk, that little gray square that you see, that's all the natural proteins that we know of, those 200 million proteins. All those pink squares, those are all the possible proteins that we can make. So when you think back to Drexler's vision of nanobots, then perhaps this might be what he was thinking of. So there's a lot of potential here to create new and exciting things, <clears throat> and the seven proteomics stocks that we've been following, you can see here, the last time that we wrote about these, we also did an accompanying video, and that would have been in August of last year. And here you can see the change in market cap for each of these firms since then. So uh, most have fallen, uh, a couple have uh, increased over time. Now, in order to produce this video, I pulled up our tech stock catalog, and it's worth talking about for just a second. So we put together an Excel spreadsheet that contains 460 tech stocks that we cover. And here you can see all the fields of data in that spreadsheet. So you have your category and subcategory. If you filter on proteomics, you can pull up these seven stocks. And we have our status, whether we love, that means we own a stock, like, may like to own, or avoid, caution against owning a stock. Then, of course, the asset name, the tickers, foreign exchange, and a couple flags, ETF. If it's a SPAC, you can filter on SPACs. I think there's over 90 SPACs in the catalog. Uh, whether or not something is SAS, so it can be NA, no SAS, some SAS, pure SAS. Uh, and then this Nanalyze Notes field is really useful, and I used it for this presentation. It's just a couple sentences on how we feel about any of the 460 stocks in that catalog. And you should be able to articulate your thesis <clears throat> in a couple sentences, and that's what we've done there. The notes date will tell you the last time that we posted in that notes field, and you can access a link to the latest article. And then this refinitive piece, this is really slick. This is where you can pull in data such as price, market cap, and the currency that's being used. And then the blue fields here, this is data that we input ourselves. So we have last quarter's revenues and last quarter COGS. Of course, the label there last quarter refers to which quarter we pulled in. That allows us then to calculate valuation ratio off of market cap and revenue. And then if we have revenue in COGS, we can calculate gross margin. So we've done that for quite a few names. And then, of course, at the end, we have our average purchase price for stocks we're holding and our gain loss. Now, what I've done here is filtered in that catalog for proteomics. And you can see there's seven names here that we're going to talk about. And when you're monitoring seven stocks, uh, note a few things. So you may not love or like any stocks for a given theme, and that's fine. We usually see that happening when a leader hasn't emerged in a particular field. 
And another thing you'll notice is that your preferred choice will change over time based on what's happening and which companies are further ahead and companies run into problems, things like that. Technology changes very fast. Now, if you're avoiding a stock, you should be able to articulate the showstoppers very quickly. So how do we monitor 460 stocks? Well, we go through and we look for red flags. That's the approach we take. We assume there's some great bull thesis that's being espoused by 37 different YouTubers out there. That's a given. What we're interested in as risk-averse investors is looking for red flags. As soon as we find one that's a showstopper, we move on and say, this company needs to get past this red flag, otherwise we're not interested. That's the same way that you go about hiring candidates when you have a big pool of individuals to select from and you're looking for top talent. The first thing that you do is get rid of all the crap. So that's what we try to do. We're always looking to invest in emerging leaders. So that's kind of the focus of when we uh, analyze a population of stocks and leaderships typically determined by market cap, size, and revenue growth. That's the pace at which the total addressable market, the opportunity, is being captured. Now, Quanterix happens to be a stock that we're holding. And this is because when we decided we wanted exposure to proteomics and we analyzed those seven stocks, this is the one that stood out. Now, they ran into some problems. This would have been a year ago. And they shuffled around some management. And basically, the problems came down to quality issues with their platform where usage went down. So if you have quality issues and your customers stop using your platform, that's a huge deal. What we like about the company today is that they're actively talking about this turnaround. You can see here this slide in their recent investor deck really describes how the turnaround is coming. And this point here, double digit revenue growth in 2024, that's very important. So next year, growth is expected to resume and you can see that their uh, growth here for core product and services is, is expected to rise about 9% from last year to this year based on their guidance. And um, overall, when we uh, were making a decision about what to do with Quanterix, uh, more or less our thesis had failed and growth had stalled. And we ended up making the decision to continue holding the company because we believed that their business, along with the cash that they had on hand, was valued at a lot more than what the market had discounted the company at. So uh, since then, uh, shares have been steadily moving upwards. Not that we care much about short-term price appreciation, but now that this is more reflective, the valuation is more reflective of what we believe the company is worth, we're going to take a look at them, uh, I think, in August and make a decision about whether or not we want to hold Quanterix or potentially our next firm, which is looking a whole lot better. So Olink had a showstopper with last time we looked at it. We did an a entire piece on this company. I'll link to that in the description of this video, along with pieces that we've done on pretty much all the companies we're going to talk about today. Olink had a showstopper, which was that services were a majority component of total revenues. You don't want to, we don't want to invest in a company that relies on services, uh, a services offering to scale because when you have uh, such a business model, it just requires more bodies to throw at it, and it can't really scale exponentially as a platform would with consumables, a uh, platform that's being used by clients. What you can see happening here, Kit would be their platform, and services, of course, is what it says on the tin. You can see that. Services is dropping. This is a comparison of the first quarter of last year compared to the first quarter of this year. Look how services is plummeting and look how Kit is uh, soaring. This is exactly what we want to see. So now we have a situation where uh, Kit, their platform, is actually a uh, majority of total revenues, and that's what we wanted to see. So uh, we're probably going to take another look at this firm around the time that we dig into our Quanterix holding. For example, we'd want to see what this other component consists of as, as it seems to be growing there. So Olink is looking a whole lot better. They have strong growth anticipated, I think, in the 30 to 40 percent range for this year. And by the way, there's a research piece that accompanies this with a lot more detail, uh, and I'll link to that. We did the research piece. I think we published it yesterday, so uh, you need to check that out for, for further details. Now, there's three SPACs 
in this lot of seven proteomics stocks. They are Somalogic, Nautilus Biotechnology, and Quantum Psi. Here I've simply shown the decline in share price since the SPAC debuted. This shouldn't be a shock to anybody. We were warning about SPAC since they first emerged, and they did retail investors no favor. So everybody else made out like bandits, but not the end investor, and that's what you see here. These valuations have simply adjusted to where they should have been if these firms went through the proper IPO process and were vetted by institutional investors instead of just uh, going along with the hype. And here you can see where this slide was taken from Somalogic's deck, and they're describing themselves as a full-spectrum proteomics platform. And they say here, substantial first-mover advantage in proteomics. Remember that. And then they compare themselves to other proteomics enablers. And you can see this list of names, and they had summed that to a $10 billion market cap. Well, that's about $3.8 billion today. So the market has adjusted its expectations of proteomics to reflect something that's probably uh, more like reality. Now, when we look at SomoLogic, or SomaLogic, $500 million in cash, thanks to their SPAC offering, but slowing revenue growth based on 2023 guidance of 80 to 84 million compared to last year where they saw 97.7 million, which was 20% over the prior year. Now, Earlier this year, the CEO departed along with three board members. That shows internal turmoil about the direction the firm should be taken. So when you look at their plans going forward, they're going to cut quarterly burn rate of $40 million in half. So that would extend their runway from around three years to five years. Now, having a first mover advantage only works if you're capturing market share and emerging as a leader. So uh, there is a concern around this revenue growth stall and perhaps what might change that or make it a little bit more uh, appealing, uh, Somalogic as an investment would be their relationship with Illumina, which has its own problems. And they're on track to commercialize this kit they're building with Illumina in 2024. So checking back in with Somalogic then, so sometime next year, seems like a good plan. Uh, this company is just too small for us to consider, as are most of the companies here. Uh, I think six out of seven would be under our $1 billion market cap cutoff. Now, when we get to the other two SPACs, uh, no revenues, no interest. So Nautilus Biotechnology expects to launch their platform in the middle of next year. Next, Quantum Psi saw revenue of $254,000 in the first quarter of this year, essentially nothing. They said they expect to accelerate their revenues in the second half of 2023, so pay attention to that. We don't invest or have any interest in firms until they show t at least $10 million per year in a single year of revenues. Then we'll take a look. So with cash on hand of uh, $332 million and a market cap of $216 million, an investment in QSI gives you about $100 million in net cash and a free proteomics business to boot. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it, as we do, is that the market doesn't have a whole lot of confidence in the future success of QSI's proteomics platform. That brings us to SEER. They had product-related revenue for the first quarter of this year uh, at around $3.6 million, with $1.3 million of related party revenues. And regular viewers will know that we don't look very kindly upon related party revenues, and here's a good explanation of why. SEER created this new entity called Prognome IQ in August of 2020, which they retained a 15% ownership of. That's now accounted for nil on their balance sheet, so essentially it's worthless. So it makes you wonder about the future prospects of this company they created. That consists of around one-third of their total revenue. So they create this new firm, and then this new firm um, uses the funding then to uh, purchase products or services from SEER. Now, SEER expects revenues of for 2023, that's this year, of 23 million to 25 million, representing growth of 48 to 61 percent over last year. Uh, they have operating costs of burning about 20 million dollars a quarter, 
cash on hand of over 400 million. So they have a runway of about five years. But if we exclude the related party revenues, which seem to consistently make up a third of their total revenues, the company's simple valuation ratio sits at around 25, which is excessively overpriced. That brings us to Codexis. This firm was showing promise. And here I've pulled one of the notes from our tech stock catalog says Codexis is showing promise, doesn't seem overvalued. Pfizer will represent at least half of total revenues in 2022. We want to see customer concentration decrease over time, not increase. Well, decrease it did. The table that you see here, we've highlighted customer A, Pfizer there. They were, what, 61% of Codexis's revenues in 2022. And look, in 2023, now they're uh, what, below 10%, and all of a sudden these other customers have emerged as the tide lowers, these other cus key customers that represent more than 10% of revenues. What happened is that customer concentration risk came home to, to roost, and uh, Pfizer's contributions to Codexis have plummeted. Uh, this new concentration risk, that might be acceptable. What isn't acceptable is the fact that in 2023, they're expecting revenues to decline by more than 50%. So that's exactly why we stay away from customer concentration risk. They believe their cash and cash equivalents will fund their planned operations through the end of next year. And another problem here is that not only are revenues declining, but gross margin as well. So gross margin this past quarter was 46% compared to 72% in the same quarter last year. They say the reason for that is largely driven by variability in the product mix. Well, there you go. With both revenue growth and gross margin trending in the wrong direction, Codexis no longer seems to have much appeal from where we're sitting. So to conclude... Olink is showing promise. We're going to change that to a like in our tech stock catalog from an avoid. We're also going to revisit Quanterix in August in a piece for paying subscribers and possibly do a piece, a dedicated piece on Olink as well. There's an opportunity cost associated with holding any stock, and that's how we look at Quanterix. Uh, we can hold them as they try to get their act together, or we can move into a company that already has its act together. And the question here is, could Olink be emerging as a leader in proteomics? So I'm going to put up another video here to watch, but before I do that, please click the Nanalyze logo here on the right, that blue logo, subscribe to our channel, then watch the video on the left. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.